I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence um, on Quarkus with Optopel. Now, I'm not going to talk about uh, the typical artificial intelligence uh, that's very that everybody talks about, namely uh, machine learning, right? Pattern recognition. How do you figure out if you have an image of a dog that it's actually a dog, and so forth, or if you have some some tape of a voice to 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 figure out what what they're saying. What I'm going to talk about is planning optimization. I think it's one of the most underestimated areas of artificial artificial intelligence, and as you'll see, hopefully, also one of the most um, interesting ones to look at, uh, profitability wise, cost reduction wise, uh, servicing service improvement wise, and so forth. So uh, yes, I'm, I'm, so I'm Geoffrey Desmet. I started the OptoPlanner project, uh, I think 15 years ago as a hobby project. Um, I'm not Hannibal Smith, but I do love it when a plan comes together, right? Um, if you remember that reference from uh, the, old, uh, the old times. Now, um, let's get started. What I'm going to build for you today is this application. It's basically an application to assign lessons to uh, a number of time slots, as you can see over here, and a number of rooms, right? And the lessons like English, chemistry, and so forth. And then when we click the green button over here, the solve button, it's actually going to find us a schedule like this. So how, what, what is the problem exactly that I'll be tackling for you today? And so you can reuse the, the knowledge you learned from this problem on many other types of planning problems, right? So for example, um, so what we're focusing on now is a school timetable problem. We have a number of lessons like math, chemistry, French, history, which have a teacher, which have a certain class that this uh, lesson is taught to. And then we have a number of options to actually schedule these lessons. We can say we're going to put them in room A or room B, and we can put them in, at the 8.30 to 9.30 time slot or at the 9.30 to 10.30 time slot. Now, there's a number of constraints. Now, constraints, that's the stuff that makes it hard for us. Now, the constraints are that these two lessons, math and chemistry, actually have the same student. Both are taught to the ninth grade. And chemistry and French have the same teacher. Both are taught by Marie Curie. So, um, and of course, lessons that are taught to the same uh, students or to the same teacher cannot happen at the same time because students and teachers cannot be in two places at the same time, right? And of course, French and history also have the same students. So what are we going to do? We're going to give it to our um, planning optimization AI, OptoPlanner in this case, of course, and then OptoPlanner will solve that for us and will tell us, okay, um, I, the best solution is where you put math in room A at 8.30, where you put French in room B at 8.30 and so forth, right? And you can see here that if you look, for example, to the students, each of the students can actually go to all of their lessons, right? Ninth grade, ninth grade. And uh, for the teachers, the same thing. You can see Marie Curie giving French and chemistry, and those are not at the same time. Those are different times. Right. And that's exactly the kind of solution we're looking for. Right. Now, of course, I'm showing it here with four lessons. So let's take a look at how difficult it would be to actually find this particular solution. How many op how many combinations are there that I can put four lessons into these four uh, slots, basically? Well, we could assign that first lesson, that math lesson, to room A830 or room B830 or room A930 and so forth. That gives us four options to actually assign math, right? To assign the second lesson, we, we, for each of those four options, we have four other options. So for example, for the first option, uh, right, we could uh, assign history, the second lesson, into uh, all the same time slot into room B830, the third time slot or the fourth time slot. So again, we have four options there, but we could also, um, and you can see these, these branches here, there's four options here. But if you look at any of the other uh, three states, we could start from door, there and also try uh, for uh, the four ways to put the history lesson, right? And so in this state, we would already have 16 options for just two lessons. Now, if we Assign three lessons. You can see here we're now adding chemistry. We could put chemistry uh, starting from this solution, of course. We're not going to start from this one because this one is not that interesting. We already have two lessons in the same room at the same time. That's not allowed. But in this case, math and history, uh, let's say we do those at the same time, then, um, uh, but that in a different room. Then we could put chemistry in the first room or in the second room or in the second time slot in the first room and so forth. So again, we have four options. And of course, each of the options we had here on the top branches out and four more options. And of course, if we put the last uh, lesson in there, like the uh, French lesson, we could again, we again have four options. And let's say we branch out from this one. This one looks pretty good. Uh, or we branch out from this one. And you can see again, more four options. So at this point, if there's a, we can see for these four lessons, there's actually quite a few options already. 
And the interesting thing is that you might think, okay, we have a good feasible solution here at the bottom where we're putting math uh, in A30 and then uh, history and then chemistry and then French like this, right? We're just showing here on the bottom. But in fact, if you look at it, uh, chemistry and French both had Marie Curie teaching it, right? So that's not a, that's not a feasible solution. And over here, um, in this solution that looks pretty feasible, it's not because history and French actually have the same students. Um, so um, the actual feasible solution is somewhere in these combinations here on the top, you know, the ones we didn't, I didn't really visualize, right? So, but just to give you an idea, if we have four, if, four, if you have one, you know, one lesson can be put into four slots here, two lessons can be put, there's a combination of 16 different states there. Um, if we have three lessons, there's a combination of six, uh, sorry, 16 different states. For three lessons, there are 64 different states. And of course, for four lessons, there's 256 uh, uh, different states. That's actually four to the power of four. So if you have actually 400 lessons, the number of states is 400 to the power of 400. And that gives you more or less 10 to the power of 1,040 different states. And one or a few of those are the ones we are looking for, right? And um, so if you try this with normal... Uh, calculations, it actually takes, well, forever, basically. So um, just to give you an idea how big the search space is. So the search space for n lessons is n to the power n. The search space for 400 lessons is 10 to the power uh, 1040. Just to compare you how big this number is, in the universe, the minimum number of atoms in the observable universe is only 10 to the power 80, right? So the ways to put 400 lessons, which is still a small school, I would argue, uh, into 400 slots. The number of combinations, number of different ways you can do that is actually less, uh, is actually far, far greater um, than, the number than the number of atoms in the observable universe, right? So um, clearly we need more advanced algorithms to do this. And this is of course where OptaPlanner comes in, right? And that, that helps you actually uh, find a good uh, solution, a, a near optimal solution in almost no time. That doesn't take billions and billions and billions of years, Googles of years to actually find that solution with uh, the computer power we have today, right? So um, is this just for lesson scheduling? Is this the only kind of problem you can solve with this? Uh, and no, it's not. You can also solve employee rostering with it. For example, uh, when we need to assign shifts to employees. So here we have a number of employees. We have a shift, like a morning shift, an afternoon shift, uh, a night shift. And we need to decide which shift is, is actually done by which employee. Now, of course, there's, again, constraints, right? So what are the constraints? Well, the constraints is you can only assign one shift per day. Or well, the constraint is that this particular shift needs somebody who has the skill of being a nurse. You cannot assign the engineer there. Vice versa, this night shift needs an engineer, not a nurse, right? So, um, and maybe on based on their contract, they, they don't want to, they cannot work weekends against this against the labor laws for certain employees. So, uh, we, but we still need to assign all of those shifts. And then on top of that, we have what we call soft constraints. Soft constraints are things we would like to do whenever possible. Um, the most famous one of those is, of course, the day off request, where this particular uh, employee says, I would not like to work on Fridays because um, I'd like to be home early on Fridays, or I would not like to work on, on Saturdays so I can take care of my kids and, and so forth. Um, those are day off requests, and we'll try to actually make sure that they don't work on those days by giving them shifts on other days, right? Um, and there's more shifts, like make sure they have enough sleep between two shifts and, and things like that, right? So this is employee rostering. Um, and this is another problem you can solve with AI planning. But the most interesting AI problem, I would argue, is vehicle routing. So what do we do in vehicle routing? Well, we have a number of vehicles. You can see them here, the pur purple truck, the green truck, and so forth. And we need to go to a number of locations across the country, either to deliver items or to install cable or to provide services, to do maintenance on machines there and so forth, right? Um, or to pick up items. And... Um, um, so, um, for example, the last mile problem is, is clearly a vehicle routing problem, right? And so what we want to do is we want to make sure that um, we have uh, enough capacity in the vehicle to do that or enough time to, to, to actually go to all the location, install that cable and be back um, uh, uh, in, in an eight hours time span, right? In the number of working hours of the technician in that vehicle. Uh, but it could also have, also have time windows where you say you need to be at that location between 8 and 10 a.m. in the morning, right? 
Um, and the soft constraints, and that's the most interesting one, is of course the driving time. The less driving time you spend, and you can you can you optimize not just which vehicle goes to which location, but also the order in which that vehicle goes to those locations, you can heavily reduce driving time. Just to give you an idea, for one Fortune 500 company, we reduced the, the, the driving time by 25%. 25%. Their management was expecting 1%. It turned out to be 25%. Um, that's actually reduced their costs by hundreds of millions of dollars per year, year over year, and also reduced their CO2 emissions by tens of millions of kilograms, uh, ten, more than 10 millions of kilograms of CO2 emissions. So um, it's a big win-win, basically, right? Um, so vehicle routing, as I would argue, is, is, is therefore one of the most uh, profitable ones. But there's many more, right? Maintenance scheduling, uh, where you need to do maintenance on electricity grids, on railroads, on ele elevators, equipment, and so forth, uh, airplanes and things like that, right? Or agenda scheduling, where you need to assign uh, court hearings to judges and magistrates and so forth, or uh, schedule TV ads as optimally as possible. Uh, job shop scheduling to uh, optimize assembly lines in factories, task assignment, uh, and, and so forth and so forth. The, the, the world is actually full of planning problems, right? And of course, um, one of the solvers to do that, one of the ways to solve that, and I would argue the best solver in the world is OptoPlanner. And um, it's an open source AI constraint solver, Apache license. You can use it from Java, but you can also use it from Kotlin. And we actually have a Python port right now too, which is a bit young though. Um, so um, we're going to build this application, right? So uh, how do we build that application? What do we build that on? Well, we will need a uh, you know, we'll need, will you do this in Java today? And um, of course, we need uh, a platform to build this on. And so we're going to use Quarkus, right? So you could use Spring too, for the record. So the planner works with Spring, but today I'm going to uh, focus on Quarkus and I'll show you some of the benefits of Quarkus, right? So Quarkus is supersonic subatomic Java. And you might think, okay, that sounds a lot of marketing talk. Uh, but it's actually true, and I'm going to actually try to show that to you today. Uh, so uh, let's take a look, right? So um, what we're going to do is we're going to build that school timetabling architecture. Um, so I have the Quark, I will have use the Quarkus platform, and I'm going to open a REST service on there um, uh, that uses the REST Easy component of Quarkus. And then I'm going to use uh, a browser, uh, a JavaScript application to to connect to that REST service with JSON, pretty standard. And then I'm going to use Hibernate to actually store my data, my, my domain objects in a relational database. Pretty, very traditional. And of course you can plug all of these things out and replace maybe this JSON thing with Kafka or replace the database with a NoSQL database. It's all possible and Quarkus of course has the support for that. And where does where can you find all of those good things, all of those things you can plug into Quarkus? You can find those on code.quarkus.io. That's also the place that will generate your POM XML to get started from if you're using Maven or if you use Gradle, your build.gradle file. So let's take a look at that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to uh, code.quarkus.io. You can see it here, this is code.quarkus.io. And in here, I can pick whatever, I can pick the, the applications that are the things that I need. So for example, if I need Hibernate, uh, I can say, okay, I'm going to use Hibernate here uh, with Panache. You'll see that in a minute. That's basically to make it easier to go back and forth to the database. That's some, does a bunch of the work for you already. Um, and I could say, okay, I'm going to use, of course, OptoPlanner with that. So let's look for OptoPlanner. Here we go. And we add OptoPlanner and, 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 and so forth, right? And then when you're done, you click generate your application and you get a POM file. And then your application might look, uh, so what I've done is I've actually uh, started the application, I've already uh, created uh, an application. So let me do that. Um, and this is the application I, I'll, I'll be showing you uh, for the rest of the day. There's no AI in this yet. This is purely that REST application, that CRUD REST application that uh, the architect I showed you a minute ago. So um, you can see the POM file here. We can see that we have a number of domain classes. I'll go through these domain classes in a minute. You can see we have some persistence. These persistence classes are very, very simple. So for example, we'll have a lesson class, right? And the, this is the persistence class. It just says I have a lesson repository uh, and that's a Panache a lesson repository. That means uh, this class can actually read and write and find all lessons and, and delete lessons and update lessons and so forth for us. It's actually, um, uh, uh, and, and, and so I can, I can reuse this lesson repository class 
uh, anywhere and I don't need to implement it. Panesh does that for me. Uh, I have some REST things. That's, that's uh, a REST. Uh, that's where all of our REST methods will go to. Uh, it, over here, I have the JavaScript. I will not go into that. I don't want <laughs> That's beyond the scope of today's uh, presentation. And then I have a demo generator class to generate some data. So uh, let's talk a little bit about those domain classes. Let me first explain you, uh, show you some of those domain classes first. So um, how does the domain look like? Now, remember, we're assigning lessons to uh, rooms and to uh, time slots. And of course, the lessons have a number of properties like their subject, their teacher, and so forth. So how does it look like domain-wise? Well, um, we have, first of all, the time slot. The time slot is known by a day of week, which is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so forth. And then we have uh, for each time slot a start time, for example, 8.30, and an end time, like for example, 9.30, right? And so we have multiple time slots, right? Multiple instances of this class, the 8.30 time slot, the 9.30 time slot, and so forth on Monday, right? And same, maybe the same on Tuesday. And then we have a number of rooms, just room A, B, C, and D, and so forth, right? And then of course, we also have a number of uh, lessons. Now, a lesson class has a subject, uh, just a string in this case, has a teacher. I've chosen to model this, the teacher just by name, just by its string, but you could actually create a teacher object and have the lesson uh, pointed at teacher object. And in a more uh, you know, uh, end user application, you would probably do that as teachers will probably have a number of extra properties beyond their name that you want to take into account for the constraints. But for now, just their name actually suffices. And then uh, each student group, which is a, a group of students that are following the same lesson, uh, that are following the same curriculum, are actually uh, in here, like this is the ninth grade or the 10th grade or things like that. Now, each of the lessons will also need to be assigned to time slots and to a room, but that's, that's the AI uh, part, right? So that's, that's, that's the part that we won't do, but that the, the AI will do for us, picking for each lesson which is the time slot, right? Like for example, Mo Monday morning, 8.30, which is the room, like for example, room A or room B, right? Okay, so that's the domain class. Now let's start coding. I'm going to switch to live coding now. And what I'm, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start the application and I'm going to use the Quarkus dev mode. Now, um, when people talk about Quarkus these days, everybody is, is wild about uh, the, the use for serverless things, like you can do native builds and so forth. And that's very, very nice and very brilliant, but I will not be talking about this today. The thing I find brilliant is actually uh, the Quarkus dev mode. And that's the part I'll actually be showing for you today. So I'm going to switch over here. I am going to open my terminal, as you can see. So, and if I just go back to my browser for a second, and you can see here at localhost, I have nothing running, right? Localhost 8080. If I now go over here and type Maven Quarkus Dev, and there's of course a Gradle equivalent if you are using Gradle, um, then this will start the uh, Quarkus application. And um, it's actually now running, and uh, you can see the warning is is, is because I'm not, I'm actually have OptoPlanner included, but there is no OptoPlanner class, so it it just tells me that. But anyway, uh, we have Quark is running, and if we now go to localhost, oh, it auto refreshed. That's interesting. Um, so it refreshed here. And what I can see now is the application is running. So we have a number of time slots. Monday, we have actually 10 time slots, as you can see, Monday and Tuesday time slots. We have three rooms, A, B, and C. And we have a number of unassigned lessons, like biology, geography, math, and so forth. Now, we have to figure out which of these lessons go to which room in which time slot. And the way we can do that is by clicking the Solve button. Unfortunately, I've not implemented any AI or any OptoPlanner stuff yet. So when I click the Solve button, I get a, a big fat error message, of course. And that's the part we're going to now solve. Right? So um, now uh, I do want to show something uh, about the, uh, the Quarkus dev mode. Um, now, you, here we go. So what's so special about that Quarkus dev mode? Well, I will not restart the Quarkus dev mode during the entire presentation. You can see it's running right now. You can see here's the error I got because I called, I pressed that green button and you can see I still have to some implement some co code and then support operation exception I'm throwing there, right? Um, so um, what I'm now going, what we're, so what we're going to do now is um, when um, Quarkus starts, it will actually uh, create a database schema based on my domain objects. It's going to insert the test data, um, and I'll show you in a minute where that actually is. 
Uh, so now let me just show you that first. So over here we have our domain classes. Like I explained, there is a room class, right? This is our room class. So this is the class room. It has a name, as I've explained. It also has a database ID in the implementation. And we're, we're using JPA Hibernate here. So that basically says, um, we're going to put this in the database. That's the entity class. All right, and there's a table called room in the database because we have an entity class here, entity annotation here. And we're also going to say we want to generate the ID in the database. So we, uh, when we put a new room into the database, we automatically want to generate the ID. And all the other stuff over here, that's just constructors, getters, and setters. That's just, that's, yeah, this Java ceremony basically, right? And then of course, for time slot, uh, we have the same thing. We have the time slot class, which has a day of week, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, a start time and an end time, like 8.30 to 9.30. And of course, again, the database ID, which is generated by the database again, hence the generated value thing, right? And again, we put this in the database. And similarly for the lesson, the lesson has uh, the ID, right? So just like all everything has a database ID, has the teacher, the, the subject, like math, French, the teacher, like Marie Curie, student group, like ninth grade. And then of course, uh, it has a foreign key to a time slot and a foreign key to a room in the database. Over here, it just has a reference, of course, to the time slot and to the room. And these are, again, and these are one to many annotations. This is JPA uh, way to say, okay, this needs to have a foreign key from the lesson table to the time slot table, right? Um, all of the other stuff, again, are just getters and setters and, and, and a bit of ceremony. Now, um, I was talking a minute ago that when we start up Maven Quarkus Dev, that it actually generates the test data. And the test data is actually generated in this class. This is the demo generator class. So well, how does it look like? Well, it says, okay, um, this is an application scope class, which means we have one instance of this. And um, it's, it knows, uh, it, it gets injected, these classes we created here, uh, the, the time slot repository, the room repository, the lesson repository. Those are the classes that allow us to write or read from the database easily. For example, here's a nice example of that. This is a time slot repository. We're going to persist a list of time slots here, right? And this is of course the time slots we create. So you can see here, we're creating 10 time slots. That's the one you see in the UI from Monday and Tuesday. But we're also creating three rooms here, room A, B, and C, right? Now, what I wanna show you is what happens if we change this into room, for example, uh, oh, Sorry, Taiwan, and I'm hoping I'm writing it correctly or at least the English way. And uh, we now go over here to the application. We have it here running here. You see it's room C here. If you click, click refresh on the top left, what you'll see is that it actually refreshes and says room Taiwan here, right? So what just happened? How did, when we click the refresh button, we saw the results pretty immediately. What just happens? So let me explain that, right? So. When Quarkus Dev started, it, create, it actually makes sure that the database schema was the same as the ones we had in our, um, in our domain objects. You can turn this on and off, of course. I've turned this on specifically for this application because it's a demo application. And then I've inserted the test data. Again, we only do this in development, but it's, it's really useful in development with that demo generator that I showed a minute ago, right? which was listening to startup events. And... Um, yeah, let me just show you that it's actually listening to startup events. It's, that's over here, right? It says, I'm observing startup events. So every time the Quarkus application starts up, we're going to insert this test data, right? And it's a transactional method, of course, which means um, that the connection to the database is transactional, right? Uh, so we don't, so we, we can assure it's atomic and things like that. But anyway, um, we have created the test data, right, when we start up. And now when we uh, first time go to that application, it says, okay, get me the timetable. It does the SQL queries where it fetches all of the lessons and all of the rooms from the database and gives that through a JSON object towards the client, right? And then the thing is, um, what I've now done, if I change that room from room C into room uh, Taipei, uh, ta 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 Taiwan, of course, right? So I had source files changed in the ID. And then when I clicked refresh, the following thing happened. Um, Quarkus saw that source files were changed. And the moment it sees that source files are changed, it actually restarts the entire application, right? It sees, oh, you changed something, let me just restart the entire application. It's not a hot deploy. It's actually a full restart of the application behind the scenes. And 
When does it do that? It does that the moment we hit the refresh, because while I'm changing the source files, it doesn't restart the application. It actually waits until I say, okay, I want to see the impact of my changes. You know, the changes are now done, or at least I want to see the first set of those changes. And then the moment you click that refresh button over there in the, in the, in the browser, you send that uh, HTTP request. And that's the moment that Quarkus says, and, oh, wait a minute, I'm not just going to execute the SQL queries. I saw you changed one of the... The, uh, the the files and then the Quarkus dev mode. Normal Quarkus mode doesn't do this, of course, only the, the development mode. And the Quarkus dev mode says, okay, I'm going to okay uh, do again the whole thing, restart the application, which means uh, you know adjusting the schema, insert inserting the test data and the SQL queries, and all of that takes less, less than a second. And let me show you that again, just just, just to be sure we're clear. So we say room hello over here, all right? We go. And we go over here, we click refresh, and you'll see immediately see the changes room hello. And let's take a look at how long that took. You can actually see that over here in the thing. That takes that took one second here. That's probably because, first of all, this is an old computer from 2015. Second of all, because of the, the zoom uh, typically reduces this. Um, when I do this on the same computer, actually without zoom and so forth, it takes half a second. Now you can actually force a restart by just clicking S here. So let's do that. You see now it restarted. Oh, look in 700 milliseconds. Let's start restart again. Here we go, 600 milliseconds. And you can see uh, it's still of course running, right? So let's change that back into room C. Here we go. Let's go back over there again. Let's do a refresh again one last time to show how fast Quarkus dev mode is. And you can see the changes. This is, of course, how you want to develop, right? You change something, you want to see the impact in the uh, application immediately. So, um, okay. Um, there's one more class I didn't explain to you. I explained to you the lesson, the room, and the time slot class. There's also one more domain class I didn't explain to you, and that's the timetable class. Now, what is the timetable class? We need a class to actually send from our uh, server to our UI, which has a list of all of the time slots, a list of all of the rooms, and a list of all of the lessons. And that's this times table class. Okay. Now, um, it's time to add some AI to this to this mix, right? So let's do some AI planning optimization. So um, we're going to add an OptiPlanner, right, to our architecture, uh, which is already there in the POM file. I've already clicked that in, in the code at Quarks.io. And, but there's no OptiPanner code whatsoever yet in, in, the, in the Java files and the source code, right? So let, let's add it. So the first thing we need to do is we need to say, okay, OptiPanner, what can you change? What can you do? Where can you make your AI decisions on? And in fact, it can make its changes on the time slot and the room variable, right? So for each of the lesson instances, like 20 lessons in, in the demo data you saw, it needs to pick the time slot and the room, right? And so that's where we put the add planning variable annotations. That's an, an OptoPlanner an annotation that says, this is something you can change. Now, any class that has one or more planning variable annotations needs to get a planning entity annotation. That's basically it's telling OptoPlanner, in this class, there's something that you will, will need to change and, um, and gives a number of information around that. So we'll need to add the planning entity annotation on the lesson class too, right? And so before we give, the, uh, when we give the problem to OptoPlanner, before solving, all of the time slots and all of the rooms will be NULL, not assigned. And after solving, all of them will be assigned to a particular time slot and a particular room, right? So let's take a look at, let's actually start doing that. I'm going to go to the lesson class here. You can see Quarkus Dev is still running, right? So I'm just going to ma start making changes. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, this is the class, this has something that OptoPlanner can change. So this is a planning entity, right? Here we go. And um, then, of course, what can it change? It can change the time slot. So we're going to tell up the planner, you can change the uh, times uh, the time slot. We do need to give, tell them wh which time slots can you choose from, right? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, okay, um, you can choose from the time slot range. And later on, I'll actually hook this ID into a list of time slots that OptoPlanner can choose from. And similarly, OptoPlanner can also assign the uh, the room. So we're, and same thing. We need to give them a list of rooms. So I'm going to say there's a room range somewhere. Okay. So now OptoPlanner knows. Okay, I can modify the lesson class, but it still needs to get a list of all the lessons. It still needs to get a list of all the rooms to pick from, and it still needs to get a list of all the time slots to pick from to put in all of these lessons. And guess where we have that? We have that in our timetable class. 
So um, this is what we give to Optoplanner, but it's also what Optoplanner will give to us after solving. It's also the solution that it will give us after solving. So this is then called planning solution. So we tell Optoplanner, this has your list of times, your, you know, your list of times, slots, rooms, and lessons. So this is a planning solution. And um, so we said, okay, where is my list of time lessons? So we tell Optoplanner, here's our list of entity. So this is our planning entity collection property, which basically means this is our this is a property that's or or a field that has a, a, a collection, a list in this case of planning entities. So the, here are all the lessons you need to assign OptoPlanner, right? And then we need to have it choose pick from a number of time slots. And remember, we need to in the lesson we need to assign every le lesson to a time slot. But we need to get that list of time slots, that time slots range somewhere. Surprise, surprise, that's this list of time slots, right? So we're going to say this is our value range. Uh, here we provide our value range. And the ID for that is the time slot range, right? Similarly, for the rooms, we will also have a value range provider saying, okay, this is the list of rooms to pick from, right? To assign the other one. And, and so these IDs, the time slot range and the room ID, need to match the ones we have here, All right? Now in our time slot class, we need one more thing. When OptoPlanner solves it for us it and gives a solution, it will also not just give us a solution, it will tell us how good it thinks the solution is. And that's done by a score. More particularly, because we use hard and soft constraints, a hard and soft score. What we're going to do here is we're going to add a hard and soft score uh, property. Uh, this is this is a, a very lightweight. Uh, this is just this has two numbers: the hard score and the soft score. Uh, the, the, this class, an immutable, uh, small immutable class, and we're going to say, okay, uh, OptoPlanner, this is where you can put the score that you've calculated. So when OptoPlanner so solves the problem, uh, it is going to also grade the problem and uh, grade the solution and put that score uh, of that solution into this class thing. Uh, we do need some getters and setters for that, so let's do that for that score. So uh, normally we only need getters, but for the score, as OptoPlanner needs to modify it, and we're also going to generate. Actually, you don't because we go through the fields. For OptoPlanner, you don't, but we need it for. I'll show that we just need the getter for uh, Jackson. Otherwise, Jackson will not uh, uh, take the the score and actually give it and put it in the JSON object. Okay. So we're almost ready. Um, well, we've done part one. We've annotated domain, and now OptoPlanner can solve the domain for us. Uh, but we still need to give us uh, give him what are our constraints. And so uh, there's two more things we need to do. The first thing is we need to give him our constraints. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, okay, uh, my constraint provider. All right, let me add. And uh, I'm going to implement the constraint provider interface. So what is the constraint provider interface? It basically is um, uh, the, uh, a way to tell OptoPlanner, these are my constraints. And you tell them by implementing the define constraint method. So this is the define constraint method, which returns an array of constraints. Uh, and these are, of course, OptoPlanner objects. Now, for now, I'm just simply going to return an empty ar array. Here we go, an empty array. So I'm going to say there are no constraints. OptoPlanner, you can do whatever you want. And then um, that's part two. And the last part we need to do is, of course, hook it up in, into our code. Now, we saw earlier when I clicked the green button, I got this unsupported operation exception over here. So here's the part that we need to actually now implement. When we click the green button in the application over here, when we click this green button, right, which will, by the way, still, uh, uh, it will now, yeah, yeah it's, it will actually crash, of course. Um, ah, it doesn't throw the end up, up, uh, stop. Uh, let me return that over here so when I yeah, now it will actually click here you can see it, it throws that error right we're going to start implementing yeah, that's the error over here so if we now start implementing this uh, we, we now we can solve it right so now to solve it I need something from OptoPlanner to help me solve it and the thing that can help me solve it well, for entities you have an entity manager for solvers you have a solver manager so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually inject solver manager that's given my timetable class, uh, it can solve that for me, right? So here we go, solver manager. I also need to give it uh, a type of, uh, uh, and uh, the way that when I give it multiple things to solve, I need to give those things a problem ID, we call that. And I'm going to use that as a long. You can use a string there to or UUID or other options. Um, 
Okay, so I'm going to inject the solver manager. So now what I can do is I can say when the solve method comes in, I can say, okay, of the planner, I want you to solve something, right? I don't just want you to solve. I also want to listen to uh, events when uh, every time you find a new better solution, I want to listen to that and I want to do something, right? So, so that's the method we're going to call when, when the solve method starts. And in that, the first, we need to give it three things. The first thing is that idea I talked about, but as we only have one data set, one school that we're solving today, I'm just going to hard code the ID to one long, right? Um, so the second thing we need to give it is a read method. And the third thing we need to give it is a write method. So the read method is basically, um, you know, given that problem ID, uh, this is that one L actually, right? You, we want to uh, load uh, the time so table. So this is basically we now hook in the read method, which says um, when Opto Planner starts to solve, it's going to read load the timetable. And what is this? It will say I'm creating a new timetable based upon all of the lessons, all of the time slots in the in the database, all of the rooms in the database, and all of the lessons in the database. It creates a new timetable. Uh, this is also the method that we that is called when we run from the UI. And uh, that's the one we, ho we hook in here to, to load the database, right? And then of course, uh, given a, a, a solution, given a timetable, so time we're going to need to save that. And so we're going to, uh, this is the read method, uh, the write method, right? So before solving, you load it here. This is the write method after solving, right? After we've done solving and show us the solution. So let's try that out, right? So right, now we have everything hooked up. You can actually refresh here. And of course, when we click now the solve button, OptoPlanner will solve this problem for us. But remember, we don't have any constraints. We had an empty constraints uh, list. So let's click the solve button. And here you go. Um, and there's a refresh of two seconds of the UI to, to get that best solution from the database. And you can see OptoPlanner solved it for us, right? Um, not that well. It put all of the lessons uh, in the same room at the same time, Monday morning, 8, uh, 8 uh, 30 in room A. And why is that? It's because there are no constraints implemented so far. If you remember, if we go back to our code here, the constraint provider, no constraints. So OptoPlanner could do whatever it wanted and uh, it pretty much did. It was very easy to solve. I could solve this too, this way. So of course, very a bad solution, right? So we need constraints. Like I said, there's two types of constraints. Hard constraints, which must not be broken, and soft constraints, which we want to optimize if all of the hard constraints are optimized and then we want to avoid breaking those too. Right, or and sometimes you can have rewards too, and we support that too, of course. Now, um, how could you implement this? Well, we have the room con conflict constraint, right? We don't want to have multiple lessons in the same room at the same time. So what you could do is you could say, okay, I am going to go through all of the lessons uh, in a for loop. I go through all of the other lessons in the for loop. I check if they are in the same time slot and the same room. And if so, if two lessons are in the same time slot in the same room then of course we lose a hard score. And that's of course, we tell that to OptoPlanner. OptoPlanner, you know, uh, if we have, you know, three pairs of conflicting lessons, then we lose, we lose three hard score, right? We lose three points of hard score. What's the problem with this? Problem with this, it's not incremental, it's slow. And why is it slow? Because we want to, we want to, so we want to look at solutions 10,000 times per second, right? So um, this needs to be extremely fast. And so when you have a big data set with 400 lessons and one of the room uh, of the math lesson, and then the math lesson changes from one room to another room, it checks again all of the other uh, combinations of lessons too. It checks again if French and chemistry use the same room or not. But the thing is, if you change the math lesson from room, whether or not French and chemistry use the same room at the same time will not change, right? And so there's no need to check that. And that's very, that doesn't scale well. So this approach, you can do that in OptoPanner. We have the support for that. Doesn't scale well. There's a much better approach. That's the part I'm going to show to you right now. That's using our constraint streams API, very much like Java 8 streams or SQL. Now let me show you how that works. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say, okay, I want to have a room conflict constraint. All right, so here we go. Uh, we create a new constraint that returns a room con conflict constraint. And so we're going to say for my constraint factory, please create um, uh, a constraint for us from starting from the uh, any time for any lesson, lesson you have, for any lesson you have. So here we go, we take any lesson. 
Uh, and this is very much like SQL from, so select any lesson, right? Uh, and then join that with any other lesson, right? And then we have a pair of lessons and we're going to penalize two lessons in the same room at the same time. So we're going to penalize this as a room conflict. And we're going to say this is a, a hard score. So this is a hard con constraint, right? And then of course, now we select any lesson and we're going to join it with any other lesson. So any pair of lessons will actually penalize the, the room conflict. Um, what we're going to say is they need to be in the same room and they need to be at the same time. So we're going to say, um, here we go. We need, there's a, a, a condition there that they are in the same room and also that they are at the same time. Now, this is a much more declarative way of, 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 of declaring uh, the constraint than that for loop I showed you earlier, but it has a number of advantages. Uh, the first thing is that incremental thing. If one of the le lessons change, then uh, OptoPlan will only incrementally calculate the influence on that on, on the pairs that actually involve that lesson. And the second thing is because we're using joiners here, uh, it can actually, uh, which where you say, okay, the, the room it needs on the first and the second lesson, that's the, the, the return from that lesson get room call needs to be the same. We can actually start indexing that, do hash tables and actually get an additional performance benefits, much less than the incremental calculation, but still uh, very big, you know, big, uh, big old, uh, benefits, right? So um, this is that room conflict constraint. So let's take a look at how that works out, right? Let's go back to our code here, right? We refresh and we solve this. And what do we see? Now, all of the lessons there, we don't have any more lessons in the same room at the same time, right? Now you might think, oh, this looks like a good schedule. We've solved it. And in fact, this I could do this as a human very easily. I could easily create a schedule. But it's in fact creating high school teams is actually quite difficult because when you look at it per student group, um, and you can see where the students need to go. We can now see that the tenth grade needs to go to chemistry and math at the same time, and that's not good, right? And then over here, the ninth grade needs to go to English and math at the same time. If we look at it by teacher, we see the same thing over here. Marie Curie needs to be in two places at the same time for the French and the physics class on, on Tuesday. So. We're going, we need to add those constraints too. And that's where it gets difficult because of course, when you want to fix this, you might need to do changes over here in your room schedule. And because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's views on the same data, right? Um, the, the, if you watch them per teacher, um, if you change them per teacher, you change them per room too, right? So well, let's do that. Let's add uh, two constraints here. One for the teacher conflict and one for the student group conflict. Okay, um, I'm going to add those two methods too. So the first one is the teacher conflict and the second one is the student group conflict. So this one is the teacher conflict and this is the student group conflict. So what's different? So when we look at the teacher conflict, we have a lesson, we select another lesson that has to have, has to be in the same time slot but has to have the same teacher. We don't care about the room in this particular case. We want to just want to say, if a teacher has two lessons at the same time, we have a problem. So if a teacher, same teacher, same time slot, two of those lessons, we have a problem. Same thing for the student groups. If we have a student group uh, where there's two lessons which have the same student group at the same time, we have a student group conflict. So when we now go back to the application and we click the solve button, we're going to get um, a schedule that's feasible room-wise. You can see one lesson in one room at a time. You can see we have a, a, a it's feasible for teachers. You can see Marie Curie no longer has to be in two places at the same time. It's good. You look at it per student group, and you can see every student group can uh, go to all of their lessons without a problem. Now, you might have seen this is not really an this is a this is a feasible schedule. You can actually put this in production. But you might have your teachers complain a little bit. You can still see gaps here, right? Like Marie Curie, well, she gives two lessons, then she has a gap hour, then she has to do another lesson, right? You, you don't want this. You want a compact schedule for your teachers. And that's one of the soft constraints you can add. And uh, you can actually see how that goes in our example. We have this uh, as part of our quick starts. You can download that. There's a few additional soft constraints on that to, to improve the lives of the st students and the teachers. Like, for example, give the teachers compact, compact schedules, but I won't go into that right now. So 
Um, if you want to try that out, if you do want to take a look at that, you can get started. And you can get started by going to um, uh, optoplanner.org and you'll find a link to the quick starts there, the Optoplanner quick starts repository. And um, you just clone that quick start repository. Uh, you go into that, um, you go into the school time tabling case, like I've just shown you. And so the only thing you really do is after cloning is Maven Quark, because that's the thing I've just shown you. You go to localhost 88, you see it running, and you can start looking in, 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 the, in the code, and you'll see that those soft constraints are there too. And you can start playing with those, adjusting those to your needs. Because 80% of the constraints you find for any plan planning problem are typically the same between planning problems. It's that additional 20% that are critical, but if you don't have them, it's useless large solution. Those differ from uh, business to business, from organization to organization. And that's why you need to be able to add those into the constraints in a scalable way. <clears throat> so that's my presentation. If there's any questions on uh, OptoPanner Quarks or in, in general AI constraint solving, I'm happy to answer them. If there's any feedback, don't hesitate to let me know now on, or on the Slack chat or on Twitter. Okay, thank you, Jeffrey. So I, I think this is a pretty interesting implication. There's just a, um, optim, op, there's just like a connection between the database and the constraint software. So they, they just you just optimize the optimize the database optimize the so I work, uh, you just 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 that like application that just can use the machine learning machine learning application so we can solve that. Uh, projects much more easier. So uh, let me start, let me try if there are any question about this. So um, and, and and by the way, that's a very interesting thing. So um, you can actually combine machine learning with OptoPlan. So you can say I'm going to use machine learning to predict uh, how many deliveries oh. I will need to do in in let's say Taipei, right? And then mm. you can use uh, OptoPlan to figure out okay, based upon under information, we need to send that many vehicles to that street in 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 Taipei, and and then Opto so. Machine learning is really good to do predictions, and then uh, AI constraint solving is really good to um, actually uh, use those predictions and act upon those. What to do and how to optimize based upon that information. So the combination is actually is actually the the, the real future, I believe. So so I can just use the customize the machine learning algorithm in the software or. or um, you would do it before that. You would do this. And so first you would mm -hmm. run the, um, the machine learning to figure out, okay, uh, this is how many deliveries I'll have to do, or this is how many, let's say you're selling red sweaters in, in, in your stores, how many red sweaters you will need in this particular store to be able to, to meet demand of, of sales of those red sweaters, right? And then you use mm -hmm. OptoPanner's vehicle routing to figure out how do I get the red sweaters from my warehouse, from my factories into those stores, uh, you know, uh, uh, just before they get s sold or as efficiently as or optimally as possible, reducing my driving time and, and actually saving saving money and, and emissions, right? Okay, thank you so much. So I I, I may I may to start by starting repository on the GitHub right now. <laughs> so as the audience say, oh, thank you for uh, awesome sharing. So I I think it's pretty awesome too. So thank you so much for today's presentation and i uh so this is the end of the presentation so thank you so much Jeffy. thank you thank you Stephen. thank, thank you so much you.